Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to our campus forum on research and economic development affairs. Um, as you know, we've had a few changes in this shop, and so I, I want to um, quickly give an overview of those and move to some other changes specifically in sponsored programs before turning it over to Dave and Josh. Um, so, um, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Paul I at the helm now, um, and Dave having joined us over there in the library. By the way, we're in the library on the second floor. Somebody came in yesterday and said, we had a hard time finding you. I said, well, maybe you should come to the library more often. <laughs> yeah. But we love our new neighbors. Um, Jan's an excellent landlady, so. Um, uh, we, we, some of you probably already know our um, still relatively new compliance manager, Jane Valness. Um, but you may or may not know that Sarah Olson, uh, we, we've poached from the Beacom College to become our new um, program assistant. So we're very happy to have her as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Beacom folks are still upset with us about that. Um, okay, so um, just a few updates uh, in sponsored programs. I first want to take a moment to um, detail some internal grant programs. Uh, m most of the faculty members whom it, it concerns already know that the deadline for faculty research initiative is coming up this Friday. Um, very shortly thereafter, we'll release the RFP for s Supporting Talent for Research Trajectories, or START. That program is uh, about the same size for any individual faculty member or collaborative team, um, two and three thousand dollars respectively. The difference is that for start, we really want to see as as a non-negotiable deliverable uh, an external proposal of fifty thousand dollars or more to some agency or another. Um, that's the one uh, kind of difference between those things, and the and the Allowables are pretty broad there yet. You can fund proposal development time. You can fund um, startup things you may need for that project. You can fund gear. Um, it, it's pretty pretty flexible. Um, Josh has recommended a, a new program to go with these this year, and um, that we'll call Restart. And we'll get some inf some more information out about that later. But the basic idea there is to reignite projects that. Um, either missed the mark uh, in a previous proposal or the proposal never got out the door. Um, but basically, again, this is redoubling our efforts to get more proposals out the door and bring more f external funding in the door. Um, of course, the innovation grant um, comes out of academic affairs, so I won't say much about that. Uh, uh, but it's out, right, Dr. McKay? Well, fine, be that way. Okay, um, the the mentored the undergraduate student mentored research initiative and graduate research initiative deadlines are are also coming up this Friday. Um, m again, my guess is if you've got students working on those things, they're already well on their way. I, if they're not, I'd like to wish them luck. Um, so, in sponsored programs, what's new uh, comes at the beginning of the proposal development process in the concept stage. Everything else looks about like it did last year, but I want to take a moment to take a look at uh, a form that had been a six-page form, and we did a hatchet job on it, um, thanks in large part to, uh, to the deans, um, where we started that revision process, and also to Sarah Hare, uh, and to several faculty members who gave their input to that revision process. We now have um, a form called intent to propose that we'd like to see from faculty members at concept stage and instead of six pages long It's just over two pages long and instead of three or four signatures You're really only going to your Dean to get their blessing on whatever kind of release time or other resources might be involved at that stage um, There's a There's a compliance component that had been a lengthy hard to understand set of questions that will now trade in for a more personal interaction with the compliance manager, Jane. Um, the hope is that that will help 
people understand more thoroughly the compliance requirements of any given project. Uh, so just a few words about our partnership with Hanover Research. We're now in a kind of second iteration of that uh, contractual partnership. Um, Hanover helps us to find um, uh, funding instruments for individual researchers or for research labs. And they, they come up with a kind of comprehensive suite of funding instruments and then help folks um, prioritize you know, what of those are, you know, likeliest to come up soon, what, what's the real low-hanging fruit with good alignment between what the researchers are trying to do and the aims of the program. Um, they can help us also in proposal development stage, so you get one more set of eyes. Um, my, my eyes are attuned to, you know, alignment with the RFP and, um, you know, making a compelling argument and, and dotting I's and, and crossing T's and that sort of thing. Their eyes are more attuned to uh, agency level specifics. And they've got folks with vastly more experience than I could hope to have um, with individual agencies. Uh, and so those reviews have been really valuable for us and could be valuable for those of you who are preparing proposals as well. Um, and then they have a number of other things available through Hanover Digital. Um, if you're curious about what those metrics can show you uh, about enrollment, about um, um, data points that might inform your proposal, about any number of other things, um, please talk to me. I can help you get access to those resources as well. Uh, so and finally, I want to detail a, a few recent wins. Um, First up is uh, Dr. Ashley Podorowski. Um She's gone after this national research traineeship uh, collaborative proposal with partners at School of Mines, USD, and SDSU. This is a very big win for DSU. The whole proposal is worth $3 million, and, and our piece is quite large. It's uh, north of $350,000 to understand and thwart illicit economies. She's doing really fascinating work with that. Um, Katie Anderson recently got funded for a second year of support uh, on elevating and celebrating effective teachers and teaching. It's a really wonderful event that will uh, again be hosted um, somewhere East River, not sure where yet. And um, Dr. Barry will be working on um, some inclusion discourse across campus, there's a, a strategy that she's putting together with the Bush Foundation called Spoke Plus Inclusion. Um, so you can expect to hear more about that from her very soon. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll announce an upcoming program that Jane is offering for compliance. Um, researchers, this is a great opportunity to, to get uh, a jump start on compliance issues that you might run into as you're preparing proposals. Um, other folks who might have other interests in export controls or in human subjects might also find it interesting. Um, she'll offer that on Tuesday the 23rd from 2 to 3 uh, in TCB in the smaller space there. So that'll do it for me. I'll turn it over to Dave and thanks. Hello. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm uh, Dave Link. Is this tr still turned on? Yeah, good. Um, uh, director for the Mad Labs uh, initiative. And uh, just wanted to give you a quick update on what's uh, happening with that now. Uh, uh, I am also in the library with uh, Josh and Pete and Jane and, and Sarah. Uh, Dick kicked me out of the Beacom when I was over there. I was too disruptive <laughs> there. And then. Uh, uh, Corey uh, first tried to freeze me out of East Hall, and then he tried to flood me out of East Hall, and uh, I, I took the hint, and <laughs> so I, I took the hint. <laughs> I took the hint and got over there. Uh, anyway, that's uh, where we are. It's a great, great place to be. Um, so, just wanted to go through just a couple of background things about the Mad Labs, and then show you some pictures and talk about uh, a few of the projects here. Uh, President Griffiths uh, really had a vision to create. Uh, a facility and then programs that would really advance the uh, applied research that we're doing here on the campus, really involving uh, faculty and students. 
uh, but also to uh, promote economic development in the region. In fact, she set an initial goal of creating uh, 200 new uh, job opportunities for people through the Mad Labs initiative. Um, we're also working with a variety of uh, corporate and government partners to facilitate all of the, the projects. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, that in more detail in a little bit here. So the design goals of the building were really to maximize uh, collaboration within the facility. Uh, been shown uh, consistently that bringing researchers together from different disciplines really increases the output of everybody. So we've tried to as much as possible to maintain an open concept within the facility. Want it to be very flexible to adapt to future needs. Uh, the Mad Labs change literally uh, weekly in terms of either what they're doing, how they're doing it, or who their partners are. And uh, we knew that uh, Mad Labs would come and go over time, so we wanted to maintain a lot of flexibility with that. Um, and then uh, we wanted the building to really reflect uh, the technology and the nature of the activities going on in the building, but maintain some consistency uh, with the overall campus. So tried to achieve those with the building design. Uh, as you've probably seen, the building cost is uh, $18 million uh, when we open it up. It'll have space for over 200 people within the facility, about 38,500 square feet, and the Cyclops is 20,000 of that, and the remainder is the Mad Labs and, and shared area within the building. So uh, just to give you kind of a few visuals, uh, you can see the building that we're in right now on the left of the picture. This is really kind of if you're standing on the uh, southwest uh, corner of the top of the library looking at the building. The left, the right-hand portion of that building is the, where the Mad Labs are on the right. Did I say, did I say that right? Yeah. And the left-hand side is where the Cyclops uh, portion is. Cyclops is uh, two stories. Uh, you can see the Josh insisted on a lot of windows in that portion of the building. Uh, and we'll go through a few more views here. This would be ground level. Uh, kind of looking out the front of the library. And so you see the entrance to the Mad Labs area uh, where the people are, are walking. Actually, that's the entrance for the whole facility. Both Mad Labs and Cyclops will enter through that portion of it. This would be looking from the southwest corner uh, to the northeast. Uh, Again, seeing Mad Labs. You see the both buildings have kind of a, a dotted uh, digital uh, design to it. That's really to kind of reflect what's going on in the building. And we'll, uh, uh, even on the, on the Cyclops portion of the building, uh, that actually says something. Josh, what does that say? And as we talked about doing that on the side of the building, uh, we wanted to make sure that if we just did it randomly, it actually didn't spell something we didn't want to spell. So, <laughs> so Josh actually uh, uh, designed that, uh, shipped it out to a bunch of different people to say, hey, does this really say what I think it says, and can you manipulate it any other way? So, uh, so this is kind of just moving down, down the block, uh, about a block, looking back up to the uh, northwest. And then this is uh, from uh, 6th Street, looking north, a nighttime view of what the building would look like with the lights on inside the Mad Labs. So just to kind of give you that. Uh, so I think it's going to be a great looking building, great addition to the campus. Uh, but what's more important is really what's inside it and the program development. Uh, the building really does nothing for us if we don't uh, uh, build the new program. So. There are uh, existing, uh, about a dozen existing Mad Labs uh, right now. I say about because uh, we're, t we're talking about more uh, every day. Uh, I'll just talk about a few of these uh, here. We have a few of the directors here. Uh, Justin's uh, director of the ADAPT lab. And so Justin, as you probably know, is really working to see how do you apply digital technology to improve accessibility for any population that needs accessibility. Doing some really fun, exciting things. Uh, we met with uh, Justin just today to spec out more ideas for the equipment that we need in, in his lab there. Uh, C-Bar, I saw Dan somewhere here. Dan, Dan Talley is working on uh, really applying business analytics to uh, business problems that organizations have. So he's working with one uh, client that uh, uh, we're working on an agreement with right now. 
they're going to ship him a, a big pile of data that reflects how their customers use their particular product. And they've claimed to their customers that this, uh, this product uh, improves their economic efficiency of what they're doing. They have all this data now, and he's going to analyze that and say, okay, it, it does that or it doesn't do that, or if he did this, it would do it better, uh, doing that kind of uh, analytic research. A K hit you're all familiar with, uh, Dan's, I don't see Dan here today, but Dan's area, existing uh, lab that will move over there and uh, expand uh, their activities. Uh, Campus IT Living Lab is kind of uh, Dave Overby's uh, and his team's uh, playground. Uh, will serve a couple different purposes. One, it will allow us to um, uh, test new educational technology, wh whatever that may be. So it'll be designed so you could set it up at the classroom and uh, see how the different technology works within a classroom. But we'll also be using it just as kind of a generic uh, test area for all sorts of different uh, business and computer uh, consumer uh, technology. So we may at one time have a hospital bed in there, a smart hospital bed testing that for some client. Uh, we may have a couple of uh, uh, refrigerators uh, or stoves or things that are connected to the internet for all sorts of different consumer uh, devices. Um, I'm going to tell you about the lab, the Patriot Lab next, just because that sits right next to that IT Living Lab. And you know uh, Yang's research in terms of uh, the Internet of Things and the security of the Internet of Things. And these are the billions of, I guess it's Internet of Everything now. Is that what we're termi terminology we're changing to? Uh, and it literally is Internet of Everything. Uh, and all these different devices uh, that you either have in your home or that businesses have that connect to the Internet or their corporate networks in uh, some manner, uh, what security is built into those, what is not, what uh, vulnerabilities do they uh, leave an organization open to. So the Patriot Lab is really focusing on all of those activities. We're working with a couple of uh, potential clients in Sioux Falls testing different devices. In one case, it's a device that they manufacture that they sell to customers that they want to see how well it's hardened. In another case, it's uh, devices that this organization buys from vendors and they need a process for determining uh, how uh, vulnerable those devices are if they add them to their network. Um, the Dig Force Lab, Digital Forensics Lab, you probably saw an announcement last week. We hired a director for that, uh, Trevor Jones, and he'll be working with uh, Dr. Podorowski in implementing uh, our first set of services for the state of South Dakota. Uh, we're working on an agreement with them right now where we'll, we'll be doing a couple things. We'll be a resource for the uh, Division of Consumer Protection, uh, opening up a call center for them. And when they get calls from consumers that they can't answer, saying they have a ransomware attack or an email compromise or whatever, uh, they, they will be able to refer that to uh, our call center here. Uh, we'll have experts available to guide them through whatever they need to do to either s pay the ransom or, or, or do whatever it is on the particular situation, but better yet to give them uh, guidance on what not to do in the future so they're not in that uh, the situation. Uh, also be providing training for law enforcement across the state in terms of what do they do when they come on to a crime scene and have a piece of digital evidence. What should they do, what should they not do is just as important in that situation. So traveling around the state doing that. And finally, the most exciting part of it will be uh, actually extracting and analyzing uh, digital evidence uh, for law enforcement uh, in the state. A uh, couple of institutes uh, within uh, uh, Mad Labs as well, the Classics Institute, uh, Dr. Uh, Bottoms area, but really focusing on uh, cyber eth ethics, the whole world of cyber ethics has uh, a thousand uh, permutations, literally. And uh, so he's uh, writing, thinking, and uh, lecturing on that. And then you're all well aware of uh, Cyber and the success that they've had uh, reaching their 10,000th uh, student uh, last summer. I uh, have a number of new labs uh, in process right now, a red team, so really kind of creating a, a standing resource for penetration <coughs> testing and really the full scope of penetration testing going from the social engineering through the, the technical aspects uh, of the attack. Uh, looking at an advanced uh, simulation uh, mad lab, looking at how you apply uh, game technology uh, to other situations. 
uh, our artificial intelligence lab and a machine learning lab are the last two that we're in discussions about uh, creating right now. So just to give you a sense, the first uh, picture, I don't know how that sh doesn't show up real well there right now. We'll bring back uh, next time actual pictures of the areas, what they are uh, ren renderings of the different areas of what they look like. But uh, that is the floor plan. And I'm just going to go kind of quickly from left to right across there. The very left portion, bottom left, is uh, the research uh, offices. Uh, going into the area where you see it kind of looks like a bunch of uh, chairs. This is a 40-person briefing room coming off of the lobby. The uh, doors of that briefing room, uh, or the actually glass walls of that briefing room, open up so it could be expanded into this area there for a larger, a larger function. Moving uh, across there, uh, IT Living Lab uh, in this section, and then the next one is the Patriot Lab. Up in this area, we have made provisions to have a SOC, uh, a Security Operations Center. Uh, we're talking with a couple of different uh, potential clients for occupying that space. We have, uh, I can't even read it right now, uh, a DAP lab uh, right there is next to that. Uh, and this would be a workroom for the anybody in the facility there. So we'll have a, uh, a shop area essentially uh, where you can, uh, if uh, we need to, uh, Justin needs to modify some devices. Uh, probably have a 3D printer there, might have a laser cutter in there, have an area for soldering. Uh, if it actually needs to pull some chips off the devices to analyze those, uh, be able to do that within that area. Uh, we show th uh, three small meeting rooms there. Uh, that's actually going to become uh, one larger meeting room and one smaller meeting room just to meet the needs, evolving needs of the building. And then the rest of the Mad Labs moving down around the corner there, again, in an open concept uh, design. So that's what it looks like uh, uh, right now. If you have any questions, we respond to that, or I'll turn it over to Josh. Yes. Yes, we will. Um, so uh, we will have uh, some sort of open house uh, uh, when it's completed. The Mad Lab side of it, and I didn't even talk about Josh's area, uh, Mad Lab side of it uh, will be accessible. Uh, will require a, a card entry or some type of uh, secure entry, but it will be, and so we'll have faculty and students in and out of uh, that portion of the building. Again, we will have an open house uh, for that. And there will be a variety of different, uh, as we're envisioning it, uh, functions within uh, the briefing area. Uh, as well. So. Other? We didn't mention the big uh, blo white blob at the top of the building. That's uh, the Cyclops lab. And that is all the detail that, uh, that we can show about that portion of the building. So. All right, so I get to uh, back clean up here. Uh, so, some more just kind of strategy stuff uh, throughout the. I'm going to use one of these damn lights. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, so, before we start, no, no grandma's sofas were injured in the making of my coat. Uh, I've caught just the line of you know what today for, for wearing this. I normally wear purple. I'm going to go back to wearing purple. So uh, Dr. McKay and Mark Millage and some of those guys today, let me have it. Uh, so before we get into it, just a couple things. The, the question about can you see the building? Uh, so the front of the building will be open just like any other building. So you can come in and you can say hi to us, and, and that'll be great. We envision the Mad Labs being um, fairly open, right? So I think initially when we planned the building, it was going to be this lockdown thing that, that nobody ever got to be part of. Um, so that's not what we're doing here, right? So that's, it's, it's the first research building on campus, um, but, you know, we want to, we want to make it a showcase. So, um, you know, I envision Discover Days and some of those things going through there just to kind of show what DSU is about. Okay, so I have some more uh, kind of high-level strategy stuff to share with you. 
Um, so before we dive in, as, as everyone has said, we're on the second floor. Uh, Sarah's a great host. Normally we have Rice Krispie treats and uh, cheese balls. For some reason, we're a cheese balls uh, group. And if, you, if that can't get you up there, we are test driving some of the furniture that we have planned for the new building. Uh, we have up in our offices, so if you'd kind of like to see some of the colors uh, or the furniture, uh, that's another decent reason to uh, visit. Dr. Hans is not paying attention, so we'll move on. So if, if you, uh, so last time when Dr. Hansen was in this spot, he, uh, he had some little bison run across the, the screen. So as an NDSU alum, I thought I would do the same. But I knew he wasn't going to be paying attention, so I upped my game, found this one. Oh, I, I have people, right? I have people. So I won't say, but I know what year this calendar what year that calendar on your wall says. So I'll leave it at that. There's also, there's also this one. This is actually why we're here today. It's to memory lane. OK, so anyways. Uh, so I kind of broke this up into three spots. So one is some things we're doing research affairs wise for faculty, uh, some things we're doing for our students, and then things we're doing more as, as an institution. So on the, on the faculty side, there's all that great stuff that Dr. Hazing mentioned. Um, we're also working with um, Dr. McKay on uh, more research intensive uh, faculty assignments across campus. So we're going to try to test drive some of that with uh, some Beacom college placements this year and see how that goes. Uh, and then also uh, a renewed emphasis on faculty spinoffs and commercialization. So we kind of have the traditional research stuff growing. Uh, we don't want to lose sight of kind of the research-based economic development uh, aspect of this. So uh, something that kind of is exciting, we actually get along with SDSU. So despite what you may have, may have heard or experienced in the past, uh, they have a relatively new vice president for research as well. So Dr. Dan Scholl started less than a year ago up in Brookings. Uh, so he and I have had several meetings. Uh, he actually brought his entire team down Earlier this summer, I think it was about two weeks after I started my position, um, and he came down. And uh, so we're working right now on a very broad MOU uh, with, US, with SDSU on pretty much all things research. So um, we've been up and toured their research park. Uh, we've talked intellectual property. We've talked uh, faculty spinoff, entrepreneurship support. Uh, faculty working together. So I think here, hopefully before the first of the year, we'll be able to, we'll have this big press release about the, the MOU between us and state. Uh, there are other things percolating on campus. I know there's joint academic programs and, and some of those things. Um, also, other people we get along with. Uh, so we get along with School of Mines. So they actually brought a faculty group, uh, mainly computer science this summer, um, again, coordinating faculty research and academic programs. Uh, but they have an associate uh, vice president for research who does nothing but economic development and spin-off. Um, so Dr. Joseph Wright out, at, out in, uh, at the School of Mines is very good at it. Um, last I saw, they had like almost 20 different faculty spin-off businesses. And so if you look across the system, you know, what DSU is doing and what School of Mines are doing are probably the closest in terms of applied R&D. Um, so we're going to pick their brain. Stacy was out there two weeks ago. Um, so we're going to figure out how we can tap into kind of what they're doing. So yes, we get along with, with other schools. It's great. All right, so some student things we're doing. Uh, so last week, uh, the GOED, Governor's Office of Economic Development Commission, Commissioner Scott Stern was on campus and met with our, our CEO group which is bullet two there. Uh, that's our student group for uh, entrepreneurship, support, endeavors. Um, so I think there's uh, a lot of hay to be made here with our students, which you know is fundamentally different than a faculty spinoff. So uh, we're trying to create an environment where faculty and students um, feel like we're supporting them and, and can do some of the spinoff stuff. Uh, so Mel Ustad is now at EPSCOR. Uh, if you weren't familiar with that, he's a longtime DSU supporter, working with Pete on some workshops and some other things. So that's coming. 
And then Rory Maynard is the uh, executive director of the LAIC, LAIC here in town. He has an entrepreneurship background. He's started several companies himself. He was here last week um, trying to support our students as best he can. So some of the stuff we're doing for our students. On the university side, uh, if you saw some of this in the update recently, uh, so we're really pushing to be recognized as, 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 a, res as a more research intensive university. So you can see the, the dollar amounts here on the left, which these two indicators are, I guess you have to keep score somehow, right? So these are the, these are the ways in which we keep score, um, the funding awarded and the funding expended. So before you get too excited and say, boy, we're just like a little bit from second place, um, Stacy reminded me, right? Stacy ruins all the fun. Uh, Stacy reminded me that these numbers do include the um, the state's grant for Mad Labs, right? So that was 10-ish? Ten, 10 of this, 10 or so of this 15 was uh, Mad Labs. So unless we're going to, as he said this morning, unless we're going to keep building $18 million buildings every year and getting the state to chip in, um, this number, we have some, you know, we have some work to do to keep going, which we fully intend to do. All right, so some other things at the university, university level. Uh, you may have, again, in the update or um, through the paper, the foundation purchased the Heartland Technology Center north of campus. Um, and that's really where we're brainstorming more of a research park feel to that engine camp and the campus. So I've been to Brookings twice. I've met with uh, Will down in Sioux Falls for USD's research park. And honestly, the, the best advice they're giving me is all the things they did wrong, right? Which is probably the things we really want to know. So uh, we're pushing very much into making that North Edge of campus a research park. So filling Heartland Tech Center with faculty spinoffs, business partners, uh, student spinoffs, and then uh, other things up there as we go. Um, ITS with Dave Overby uh, has done a great job. So the 100 gig, uh, 100 gig network is happening. It'll be uh, coming to campus. And then we're pursuing some federal funding right now to make a standalone research and development network that would ride on that 100 gig. So that would be a big deal. So uh, we've, we've been talking to a couple different federal agencies that might be interested in that. And if we're able to pull that off, uh, our network would actually be more robust and faster than the service provider's own networks. So that would be, you know, we'd, we'd get, to, get to poke Mark Schlanta a little bit at SDN. You know, he's a, he's a big supporter, so I'm sure he would, he, would, he would like that. So anyways, those are some of the university things. So plenty of time for questions between Pete or Dave or I on anything that's going on in our neck of the woods. Carrie, do you want to do this so the students can hear your question? I'm teaching all online this semester, and I'm also requiring all of my students to listen to this forum. So could you tell them a little bit from your perspective how this is going to really engage um, the students, especially the online students? Uh, so I think the, f the first thing is, um, you know, DSU is never going to lose its DNA of being a, of a teaching institution. So I think anything we're trying to do here is to uh, augment and support that. So I think the, the more research dollars we can bring in, the better research facilities we bring in, the more research intensive faculty we bring in, I think all kind of feeds into a more robust academic experience for the students. So um, there's been no indication of slowdown from the president or ITS in terms of investment in um, IA lab to let students come in and take their courses. More and more disciplines are getting on, kind of using the same environment. So that would, that would be my answer. So it's, it's harder to include distant students in research. It's not impossible, right? So some of our doctorate programs, you're, you're involved deeply with those. Um, but that's generally a small sliver of our students. So I think just, I think the research activity in general will, will continue to make that a robust experience. Yeah, so as I meant, I made real quick mention of it. So uh, the research faculty um, 
plan that we have with Dr. McKay and Dr. Hansen, um, you know, several of the Beacom faculty this year will be research uh, faculty members. So they're going to have a, a reduced teaching load. Obviously, the research expectations are higher. Um, but, you know, that's, that's kind of part of our maturation as an institution is um, hiring these people that have to bring dollars in. And if they don't bring dollars in, then I guess they get to have a hard talk with the provost. Um, so I, and I think that will change some of the educational things for our students. I, I do know that as the students have listened to the Beacom Institute grand opening, they've listened to our academic plan, they've listened to our athletic plan, and we've been following the announcement of the Mad Labs, and then I distribute all of the, you know, the project management executive sponsor communications that come from the president to the online students, and then we have um, discussions in the, ch in the chat of our online classes. And we have some exceptional comments from the students at how much this is um, increasing their belief that they're at the right school. It's increasing their belief in the future of DSU, and they're taking great pride um, in the changes that DSU is is generating. Um, and you know, we're becoming a lot more prominent in the news as well. And from my online students, um, both the ones I teach as well as the doc sci information students, um, there, there's definitely um, a great opportunity, and they com they always respond on the chat how glad they are that we have um, these forums and this type of information um, for them to to review. So thank you. I just want to briefly mention a couple of things. Um, one is that our uh, coordinator for undergraduate research is sitting right here, Pam Rowland, and um, so. It m both uh, pertaining to Pam and pertaining to student research more broadly, um, it, it's important for students who might not have the institutional memory to know this, to know that uh, the last couple of years have seen lots of changes in our internal grant funding for um, student research. We, it, it, we used to throw students all in one big competitive pool where undergrads were competing with more experienced undergrads and with grad students. Um, now we've separated undergraduate students from graduate students, so they're in separate competitive pools. Um, we've thrown more uh, resources toward the mentorship of undergraduate students. And so we expect to see the, the level of student research continue to rise on campus. And there are a couple of other factors that will contribute to that. One is that uh, Dr. Wang will continue to pursue a, a, a National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates um, site grant here at DSU. Another is that Dr. Gaylor is now pursuing a research at undergraduate institutions grant with National Science Foundation here at DSU. And the other is the one that I already mentioned, Dr. Paderatsky's National Research Traineeship, which will train graduate and postdoctoral researchers on a specific scope of work. So all of those things touch student research in some way. I think in the next five years, as the those grant dollars are coming in, and as we hope to attract new grant dollars for student research, we're going to continue to see that trend go in a more research active direction for students at all levels. Pam, you want to add anything to that? <laughs> or, or, or are there other questions? Okay, thanks for coming.